Welcome to Eastman's Hunting Journal Podcast Edition. I'm your host, Ike Eastman. Today's guests are Mike Eastman, my father and founder of Eastman's, and Fred Trueblood, who, through the history of Eastman's, kind of sprinkled in a little help here or there, traveled for shows, traveled with Mike when he was doing lectures, and is one of my mentors. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff with Fred, Africa trips, that stuff, and he's always good for a little tidbit of advice here and there. But... One of the, the major reason I bring them in is to talk about the history of Eastman's hunting journals in the current company, as well as some of the older stories. But I really wanted to debunk some of the misnomers, what people think of our family and where we came from. He talks about the bootstrapping, Mike showing up at a show with $50 in his pocket and having to spend 26 of it to get to the to the actual show in Sacramento, California. He had no other money. There is no trust fund here, kids. This is 100% bootstrapped company from the ground up, and he walks through some of those old-time stories and how he built it. The other thing that we talk about and why this is important right now is we just printed our 200th issue of the Eastman's Hunting Journal magazine. That's 200 issues over 35 years of printing magazines. And I sit down with Mike and my mom, Birdie, and we do, uh, I kind of just threw out the recorder on the table and asked them some questions, myself and the managing editor, Todd, who is our wingman guy. We sit down and ask him some questions, them some questions, and let them answer exactly what happened and how we got to 200 issues, as well as he, he kind of gives us a little bit of history over you know, that span of 35 years of what happened in the hunting industry, what, how gear has changed, which is another article in that magazine, as well as a timeline of here's the first magazine all the way to the last magazine and the unique changes that have happened over 35 years. So check out the 200th issue of the Eastman's Hunting Journal. Also, I want to talk about the Eastman Family History YouTube channel. So Mike does his own YouTube channel. It's called Blazed Trails Forgotten with Mike Eastman. And he goes through some of his old stories. So check that out on YouTube. But we also have a family history on Eastman's Hunting Journal's YouTube channel that goes through some of the, the backstory of how Mike, before the magazine was started, and my grandpa Gordon and all of that stuff. With that, let's sit down with Mike and Fred and talk about the history of the magazine and some of the good old stories and find out where and how this thing was bootstrapped from the ground up. Are you an avid hunter looking for the perfect trailer to haul your gear? Look no further than Team Lodge trailers. These trailers are made in South Dakota and for the ultimate hybrid of a camper and a trailer. With the ability to haul your side-by-side -side ATV, dirt bike, e-bikes, and more, you'll never have to leave your gear behind. They are extremely sturdy with no wind shake or movement when someone is walking in the camper. Plus, they are waterproof and designed by hunters who actually use the product. The bear-proof base camp ensures to safety while out in the wild. You'll also love that these trailers are outfitted with the only accessories and the features you want. Premium components are used in every part of the setups, making Team Lodge trailers the best choice for your outdoor adventures. Hey there, fellow hunters and shooting enthusiasts. Are you tired of ear-ringing shots and the fear of permanently damaging your hearing? Nobody wants to be that old guy. Look no further than Silencer Central. These top-of-the-line silencers not only protect your hearing, but also allow for that second shot if needed. The target's not even spooked by the crack of the rifle. They also provide a ship-in-barrel threading service, making the process easy and precise. Speaking of easy, don't let the paperwork pr process from the ATF deter you. Silencer Central makes it easy. They will walk you through the online forms over the phone. Upgrade your hunting game and protect your hearing with Silencer Central. First off, um, Dad, when did you, how did you come up with the idea of Eastman's, um, I know it's changed a lot, but it started with Eastman's Hunting Journal. Where did that 
come from? What was the what was the idea? Were you sleeping in bed one day and woke up and said, "Gosh, I really want to beat, beat my head against the wall and print magazines"? No, I uh, a long time ago I was uh, working uh, for my father, uh, selling videos all over the United States, door to door, and videos like. Video stores like Blockbuster yeah, before videos. Blockbuster, actually. Yeah, they before Blockbusters. There, the video market started out with mom and pop stores, sometimes in their houses, sometimes just a store. Sometimes it'd be a drug store that had a little section with videos in. This is way back when uh, when they were a VHS, and um, so my brother talked my dad into. Um, Putting them, putting his old t his old movies that he shot back in the '60s and early '70s on these tapes, and so I went around and because I had nothing else to do, and sold them. I never been really out, out out back east. I of course being in the service stuff, I went back and forth and been places, but never traveling like that. So anyway, I I, I did that for a couple of years and. Um, I come to the conclusion that uh, there was a lot of information that people back east didn't know. Like, they didn't know that there was all this public land out there that they had access to, which you would think right now, people would say, oh, that didn't happen. Oh, yeah, they, they, did, they didn't know that because, say they lived in Pennsylvania, they thought, well, all the, all the country it was big ranches and, and private, and, and you know, and you had to get permission, and so, a lot of them wouldn't venture out here, so. And then, you know, I kept looking to magazines, and when I was an outfitter, me and my brothers, I have two brothers, we, we took some of the, uh, the old-time writers, outdoor writers, hunting, and that were supposedly authorities that, in the magazines, like The Outdoor Life, and Field and Stream, and Sports and Field, and, my dad knew a lot of them, and, and because of that, they started would come hunting with us, and and I, you know, I realized they didn't know very much. Now I'm sure that they're going to get some honking on this, but I'm telling you, they didn't. Okay, I mean, they wouldn't know how to saddle a horse. They didn't know anything about uh, animal behavior. Didn't know anything how to judge a trophy. And I kept looking through the magazines, and you know, they were shooting, uh, you know, okay deer, but nothing like some of the guys I knew, including me, would be able to take. And so I said, you know, I'll bet you I could start something and, and tell people stories because everybody likes to hear a good story. Sitting around a campfire or somebody taking a big deer. Not so much where you took it, although that's kind of morphified into that. But, you know, what kind of equipment you used, what kind of tactics did you use, this kind of stuff. And so... I figured within two years of doing that, I, it'd, it'd take off, and I'd have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, which I didn't. It didn't do that, but <laughs> but so traveling around, and I think the icing on the cake, cake is they asked me to lecture because I, I was selling, I was selling my dad's videos at Harrisburg at that big show, and that show is like. 10 days or two weeks or I don't know, it's a, it's a long, long time. And so I, uh, they got a hold of my dad. My dad says, hey, these people want, want you to, this, this video store wants you to lecture. Um, lecture, what do you mean? Yeah, just take some of my footage and, and, you know, do like I did in the old days and they'll pay you. And so I got a hold of this guy. It was Mechanicsville, uh, Pennsylvania. And so... He said, yeah, I'll, I'll pay you 500 bucks to come in and do it. And I go, for how long? He said, well, I don't know, how long do you think? I said, oh, I could probably do a 40-minute deal. Oh, that'll be good. Just come in with your film and, and you know, 16-millimeter film on a projector. My dad told me how to do it because he did it years ago. He did it back in the 50s and 60s. And so... I remember it was, a night, it was a Sunday, the last night of the show, and so I got off early from the show. It was the last day of the show. And that night, and this guy picked me up and took me to Mechanics Burgerville or whatever. And it was raining real bad, and we come up there and, and come around a corner, and here's all these people in a line, and it's just raining like heck. And this line is, I don't know, four or five blocks long. 
I go, God, what's going on here? And he says, oh, they're oh, coming to your show. And I'm going, oh, my. I've never <laughs> lectured before. Coming to, to my show? Look at all these people. So they had an auditorium there that holds 650 people, and it was packed. And so the light went off my head, kind of, sort of. I mean, you know, that was the start of, you know, there's might be something here. So, so you started lecturing, and then you took... Um, it, it, it kind of morphed into using the lectures as a marketing tool, uh, as, a, as a place to sell the subscriptions of the magazines and, and everything else you could peddle. Um, well, it kind of went, you know, that I lectured and I just kept that in my head. And I tried to, you know, tried to get the show. So I started going to shows. Uh, sports you know, shows. Sports shows and put a booth up. Because I was doing that with Gordon's uh, videos, and so that's what I was trying to do with the magazine, and I'd sell a few, but uh, it, it, it wasn't it, about five years into it, four years into it, before I really started doing my own lecturing. Yeah. So, okay, so the, you're doing these shows, uh, sports shows, trying to peddle subscriptions and everything else. And then started doing your own lectures, and in the first the first tour you did was in was in California, wasn't it? Where you actually went from place to place to yeah, place well, and did it like three or four times a, year, <laughs> a, a week. Yeah, that was another that that's where I got my foot f foot really wet in it. I was going. I, I used to do Sacramento, and it was a pretty good show. I'd sell a hundred subscriptions, hundred twenty subscriptions in five days. There, you know, people come by my little table, my booth, and I pitch them and about this magazine and so I got the I got the idea why don't I on Saturday night do my own lecture I'll go over to the Holiday Inn and rent a room not just a bedroom but a you know one of their conference lecture rooms, rooms yeah. conference rooms and I'll sit up and I'll do you know by then I was doing videos and I'll um, I'll do one a video and lecture on you know hunting out west and hunting mule deer because everybody wanted mule deer and some elk and and how to you know and and how to research areas that are produce good animals and and so I got my foot wet and how I did that too is I went back to the magazine and used the magazine and I <laughs> and I sent out invitations to everybody in California that were a subscriber. I didn't narrow it down just to Sacramento because I, I didn't really have the, we didn't have a facility to do that. So I'd send them out a first class letter and they opened it up and they had, you know, all this about it and the time, place and whatever. And so I show up there and, and I get it all set up and, a, and it wasn't that big of a room. It probably hold 200 people. And I got about 400 people show up. And I charged them. I charged them like if you would go to a movie. Well, not now. Back then, I, I charged them uh, uh, eight bucks to get in. And so I, and then I had a break. I figured that you know I did this thing. I said I'll, I'll do this, and then I, I have a rest. And and at the time, at the rest period for about 50, 20 minutes, I'll try to pedal subscriptions because that's what I wanted to do: subscriptions and. And then I go back to the second part of the the lecture, and so, and so that you know that's what I did. I did it all by, all myself. I did all the lecture. I set up the booth. I did took the money. I I, <laughs> I took uh, subscriptions during the break, and then I got back up there and talked. And that's when I said, you know, this this uh, this is pretty good. This because I made more money there than. Then, four days sitting at a show. Yeah, I, I I didn't make as many subscriptions, but this is one night. One night I sold 35 subscriptions. Well, times that, if I did like five shows, plus I could sell other things, plus they paid me eight bucks, which you take 300 guys at eight bucks to get in there. So I would, you know, I was making some money. So kind of how it started. So you now we. Fred and I were talking about this earlier, and, and there's, there's I, I can't remember, obviously. I was, I was around, I was at home, probably in high school when this all happened, but how did you and Fred meet? I, if, if I remember right, it's a pretty interesting story. I can't remember, you have to ask him. Do you remember how you met? Yeah, kind of. We had, a, we had talked on the phone or something, you know, we, we, were, we knew each other. Well, back in those days, then, we'd actually call 
a certain group of people in an area and introduce ourselves and see if we yeah. couldn't get you to hand out flyers and stuff to the local gun shops and whatever else. My wife would do that. Yeah. yeah. She would, she literally would call these guys. So we got, we were kind of acquainted that way, you know, and uh, in, in those days, you know, the, the hunting writers that Mike was talking about, they got paid to tell entertaining hunting stories. And what Mike did was, um, teach people about animals, about where to hunt, and kind of how to hunt in different terrain. So real hunters would go to this and pick up this tip or that tip, or they would say, well, this guy knows what he's talking about because he hunts like I hunt. Yeah. And so um, I thought that that's where Eastman's really got its credibility. And Mike and I Mike and I got connected one time. He's going to do a show in Oxnard, California. So he calls me up and he says, "Man, I haven't, you know, I haven't got any questions. I haven't heard anything from any of our subscribers out there about the show I got coming up." And so I said, uh, "What show?" And he says, "You do, you don't know?" And I said, "No." So he called uh, whoever distributed that stuff for him. And no, we got it sitting right here. It was in Georgia someplace. So they never mailed them. They never mailed them. And so, you know, Mule Deer Foundation, Elk Foundation, I'm sorry about this. But uh, so I said, my, uh, you know, email me a flyer. Or I didn't even have email with them. But, you know, get me a flyer. Overnight me a flyer. I'll print it up and I'll send it to everybody. I'll send it to everybody on both these distributions because we're having banquets in those right. days, big banquets. And then when you get out of here, you can pay me for the post. Because you were on the, you sat on the board of the Mule Deer Foundation yeah. then, right? Yeah. So you knew who, who was, who was in, who to invite and, and the list of people to send it to and. Yeah, I was a chapter chairman in those days. And uh, so, uh, uh, and then it created a situation that, I, that happened off and on for the rest of the time that Mike and I rode together. And that was, um, so we sent all this stuff out and Mike says, how many do you think we're gonna get? I said, I don't know, somewhere between five and 50. You know? <laughs> and so we ended up having a hell of a show and uh, Mike put on a great show for everybody and people were showing up at the last minute. I just heard about this today, you know, and that kind of well, thing. You, you put it in the newspaper. You had the yeah. newspaper guy write a, an article about yeah. it, because you showed me the article yeah. before. Usually they don't do that, but they did, and that really helped, I think. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was in the days where I could do that, you know, you <laughs> pull those strings. But when Mike and I do shows, I, was, I always thought that was one of the really incredible things. Mike and I would do shows up and down California together. I'd help him out. He'd do the show. Instead of Mike selling subscriptions, I'd sell them and take money at the door, and then he just set up his show. But, you know, you didn't know if you were going to have 12 or 120 people at these. You just opened the door and in yeah. and, and they came. And some of those shows were, you know, if a fire marshal would have walked in there, we'd all been walked out. <laughs> Too many people. Shows yeah. But we used to, they, they could call and give us their credit card for so many tickets because I put on there, you know, seating's limited. So. Once we did that, I had to go to the show because I didn't know how to give back the money to anybody with a prepaid. So I had a list. There'd be a, a list sitting there with a guy's name, like Jim Smith, and it'd be four tickets. So Jim said, yeah, two of us are here. Okay. <laughs> Other two are coming. Okay. <laughs> Slight chaos. Kind of. <laughs> but it, it kept the magazine afloat. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. It's really how you bootstrapped it. I remember a story. Uh, yeah. There was a story you were talking about Sacramento earlier, and there was a story about. Uh, tell us the one about where you, you guys were. There's people out there that think that this all came from money, and it didn't. It it didn't come from money. It was because we had no money. Tell us a story about Sacramento with the hotel. Oh yeah, well. First of all, I got to tell you, that that was always been a statement. Everybody says Eastman, and they think the Eastman Kodak. Right. So he's a baby boomer, and he's got this money. He can start this, including, and I'm going to get on my soapbox here, in Wyoming here, you got all these people that are Wyoming people like me, okay? I grew up, and my family goes back 
you know, homesteading and my wife's family homesteaded. And, uh, but the people in Wyoming, they just can't believe somebody from Wyoming could start something like this. I honestly think they think nobody, you had to come in here with a bunch of money because your name is Eastman. My name is Eastman, but I come from the other side of the family that didn't have two nickels to rub together. And so, you know, it was, it was really boots, it was really bootstrapped. It was so bad. I decided to take my little magazine the first time to go to Sacramento to the show, okay, to the big sports show that lasted five days. It's what Hunt Expo, Hunt like Hunt Expo is now, that's yeah. what that show was because there were so many hunters in California. Yeah, it was big, big. Thousands and thousands of guys would show up there. And I knew they did, but I, I didn't know anything about it. So I didn't know anything. So I booked a flight. So, and I said, okay, I'll land in Sacramento. And this is, I didn't have much. I'll tell you how much. I, I booked a flight and paid for the flight. And I took 50 bucks. I had 50 bucks in cash. Well, this is before credit cards. Well, I think. Credit cards didn't really exist. No, there was credit cards, but I didn't have one because I couldn't qualify for one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you the damn yeah. truth, okay? I couldn't qualify for a credit card. Anyway, um, so I said, okay, and I'll take a cab. I said, uh, I'll stay in a Super 8. I said, I said to myself, I can't because I was, I was also at that time repping archery equipment for one of my old-time friends now. I, I worked for him out west here going around selling archery equipment to, to dealers. So uh, I used to stay at, I used to stay at Super 8s every night, from one Super 8 out west to another one, because I could write a $25 personal check and they would take it and, and I got the money and that's what I, I lived off of that day with gas and food, believe it or not, going around. So I said, okay, I'll stay at the Super 8 here in, San, in Sacramento and then it's, it seems to be close to the convention center. So I get off the plane in Salt Lake, or not, excuse me, at Sacramento, and I get in the t cab, and I says, take me to the Super 8 here. I said, okay, and I says, where is Sacramento? And he said, oh, it's 26 miles south of here. I go, oh, how much is that going to cost me? It's going to be 26 bucks. So half my money is spent on traffic. <laughs> on the cab. Cab to get to the Super 8. And I go to the Super 8. And I look around, I go, where's the convention center? Well, it's a three quarters of a mile over there. Well, how am I going to get from here to there? I said, well, this ain't Packing all your stuff. Packing yeah, a booth uh, and yeah. magazines, which, oh, which they're I, light. I packed all that stuff on the plane as, as luggage. That's another story. So I said, I got to get, and, and so somehow, I can't remember how I did, I, I, I maybe it cost me five, six, seven bucks of my 25 that was left to take a taxi and I figured out to the Red Lion. And the Red Lion was over this, uh, over this freeway, <coughs> over, the, over the freeway to where the Coliseum was. So I got there to the Red Lion and I walked in. And I said, Do you have a room? Yeah, we got a room. And I said, Oh, good. I'll be here five days for the show. And look, a nice woman there. Looked like she was in her early 30s. And she said, Well, I'll hold this with a credit card. And I go, um, I don't have a credit card. Can I pay every day? She goes and gets a manager. And the manager looks at me. And I told him sob story about Wyoming and stuff. And he says, Okay, if you pay every day, Come in and pay every morning. You can stay. So, you know, okay. So, but getting over there took me a long time walking over there. And so I got there and I set my booth up. And the guy across from me was from Oregon, really nice Christian guy. And we started talking, and he's staying there too. I told him, kind of told him my dilemma, and he says, "Well, why don't you just ride with me back and forth every day?" I said, "Oh, okay, that's cool." So that's what I did, and so every day I'd show up there, and I sit, I sit there and pitch, pitch my subscriptions, knowing I had to come up with, I think it was a, maybe seventy or eighty dollars, which at that time would be like four subscriptions a day to pay for my room, not even, not even for a meal, but for my room, and so I'd, I'd have to pitch, and when I hit that mark, oh, okay, and then I need two more subscriptions to pay for my, 
my meal. Okay, I got that. Now the rest of this is gravy. That's helpful. So, so you bootstrapped it literally from one day to another to another to another. So Fred and I were talking earlier that it used to be not so fun to travel with you. Even when, when it grew a little bit and you had a little money and you could afford, you know, for food, you would never eat. You would never eat. Am I wrong, Fred? Yeah, man. He would, he'd say, well, I'm going to eat once a day, and, and then he'd skip that meal. <laughs> and I, and I, the rest know, of us would be like, here, we're oh, dying over I, here. I'd tell him, pull over. Why? <laughs> we got to eat today, man. <laughs> I'm getting faint. <laughs> So he'd find a place. That's why I took you to lunch before we did that. Right. He'd, that's right. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. At those shows, I never ate at those shows until after the show. And then when I did my own lectures, I ne I, I wouldn't eat because it was too early in, in the day, and I wanted to set the show up. I was too nervous. And then after I got done, it was like 10, 10, 30, so nothing was open. So I literally probably ate breakfast and something for lunch, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> That's the way I went. Yeah, I it was pretty lonely, lonely. There was, there was many times, many years I did it all by myself. I took Fred one time, one trip. I took another guy, uh, two, one guy, another trip. So that's three. Out of the three, out of the five or six years, three years I had people, at least two years, if not more, it was, I did it all, all by myself. Yeah. You know? So that's how it was. How, that's how it was bootstrapped. Now, yeah. now, to the next chapter, we're, we're we were still doing shows, still doing you know Sacramento uh, Hunt Expo wasn't a thing yet, but we did uh, one year, we did forty six shows in in January, February, and March between I think we had six groups or six teams going to forty six yes. shows. Okay. One of the things, and, and I want to tell this story, uh, we call him Uncle Roger. So Roger Selner ran the mule deer, um, the mule deer display. But before that, it was elk display, right? Yeah, he so, started out as elk. So tell me, how did that come about? How did how did you get w connected with Roger, which then led us to doing forty six shows, which you, you you know we were talking earlier about the Harrisburg show that Dad did. Fred did it for us for three or four years. Four years, yeah. It was brutal by yourself. Killer. Absolutely brutal. Killer. So how did you get connected with, with Roger, and how did that all start? With the well, greatest world record elk tour. Um, I was doing shows, and I was uh, selling my uh, Then I, okay, I, I heard about a show, and um, I was going to shows. I heard about a, a mule deer show, and... Sonora, California, or somewhere like that. And it was going to be a three, four day whole show. And they said they wanted me to lecture because I knew if I could lecture at these shows, even though, even they never paid me back then, they never paid me. Uh, I could, I could promote my book and stuff, or excuse me, my magazine. And, and I just started doing videos. I had like maybe two, two videos that I was selling too. And so I got there and set up, and I met Roger when he did Dick Idle's stuff. Dick Idle had a big whitetail white tail display for for many years, and, and Roger did that. It's when, actually the seated one. That's where the Cabela's and Bass Pro all guess, started, right? Probably. And then Schaffler had one, and, and Roger worked with him for a little bit. And so Roger had this idea, because they were all doing male deer and whitetail, he had his idea, and so he was there. He was there doing Schaffler's uh, mule deer, which was like six mule deer over 300 inches, you know, Jeez. displayed. And and he comes up to me, you know, and I I met him and saw him a few times, and he says, Eastman, I got this idea. What do you think? And he, he spelled it out doing this. And I said, Gee, that sounds really good. Oh man, that's. That would I, I said that would work, you know, where you take that display, get sponsors, go to the shows, shows would pay to have you come in, plus the sponsors would pay, and you have this display sitting there. He says, I'm looking for a major sponsor, and I said, gee, I'd be interested in that. And he said, well, I'll get back with you, but I, I'm sure either Outdoor Life or Field and Stream or somebody like this will want it. I said, yeah, you're probably right. I mean, this is a no-brainer. 
So I get a call from him about two months later, and he says, uh, I don't seem like these guys are interested, are you? I said, well, how much is this going to cost me? And I said, can, can you, will you sell, will you sell subscriptions here? He says, yeah, I'll set it up and have a little thing there and I'll sell subscriptions and we can call to, because you're the major sponsor, the uh, Eastman's Honey Journal's World Record Ale Tour. Well, how much? He says, it's going to be $15,000. $15,000. That's a lot of subscriptions at 15 bucks. Well, I sit there and I figured it out. I go, so anyway, to make a long story, story short. <laughs> I did. I said, okay. And he didn't break even, but almost. So that was the, the start of a relationship that lasted how many years? Oh, my gosh. 30, oh my probably 30. He passed away during COVID. 30 years. 30 years, yeah. 30 years of him uh, doing this. And to be honest with you, that was probably one of the major, that and the TV show, the two major reasons the uh, Eastman's Hunting Journal um, Turned out the way it did, you know, no doubt making a success. So Roger going around putting millions of miles on these trucks, showing people the Eastman tour. And it was really funny. He tried, he tried I don't know why. Oh, I, I sold my company for about four years to a public hill company, and they, their, their nickel, knuckleheads decided they didn't want to do the tour. And so Roger said, okay, I'll just get somebody else. And so he got somebody else for for a year, for a two-year contract, and the people came up and- Trying and they, to renew their easements. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it didn't work. The, his <laughs> major sponsor got mad, and so I bought the company back, and the first thing I did is hire Roger back to to run East Tour, and by then we decided to do Mule Deer because Mule Deer really was um, more popular than, than, than elk were. And, well, they're so unique. And they're not as big a, I mean, you can see, that's a, that's a big, big uh, thing to be hauling around in a trailer, yeah. whereas a mule deer's a third that size. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, Roger was an animal. He could do, out of the 46 shows that year, he'd do 23 of them. It was unbelievable. But you, Fred, did do shows for us, and a number of shows. Um, back in the day, I, I was just thinking of this as, as Dad was talking about Harrisburg. Tell us a story. I think it might have been the last year you did it, actually. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, the, we would travel January, February, March. The worst time to be on the highway, we'd be all, you know, six groups driving and trying to dodge weather and getting stuck places and, and all of those things. Tell us a story of Harrisburg, the one year where you got... Uh, where you time warped three days you didn't even know it you, in a hotel somewhere in like Alabama or something. Well, this thing started out where they had a big ice storm, you know, in the, in the plane states there. And so from Tumacari, New Mexico, almost, uh, almost to Memphis, Tennessee, it was all ice. So I had this little GMC pickup, four wheel drive, 45 mile an hour on the freeway or on the interstate there. And of course, it just took you a longer time to get there. So instead of driving 12 hours a day, you had to drive 18 hours a day, you know, right. to, get, to get there. So I was exhausted when I got there. It's a nine day show, you know, just a killer show, yeah, you know. So by the time it was over, I was worn down, I got sick. And so on the drive back, I was so sick Driving back to California, I was so sick that I'd drive two or three hours and then pull into a rest stop and sleep for a couple hours and do it. And I got to Gallup, New Mexico and started hallucinating. <laughs> I, I, I started, you know, I started seeing all kinds of stuff on the highway, you know. Did you see and, the size uh, of that chicken? Yeah, man, it was, uh, so I pulled into a day's in there and, and the guy let me stay there. He was kind of, he thought I had, you know, some terrible disease or something. And I slept for about 12 hours and got up in the, you know, my bed was sopping wet and all that. Got up, you know, took a shower and had some something to eat and drove on into California. But yeah, that th those shows are really terrible because they were they went from like 10 to 8 or something like yeah, that. Long day. days and long days. Hard to find place old, to eat. Big old barn you were in, you know. Yeah. But uh, 
Yeah, you know, when that show was over, you know, I remember telling you guys, you know what, boys, I'm not doing that again. No. And you guys said to me, well, we're surprised you did as long as you, <laughs> as you did. I kept telling you, I don't know if we should do that one. Jeez. I don't know if we should do that one. Back in the, the I'm talking the old days before when I was just doing repping. It's kind of funny story. I know our stories. When I, I was repping too, so I was traveling around the West and I would travel five days a week and then come home for two days. And then... And then I got to be where I would I had these shows to go to for the magazine because I was peddling the magazine also as I was repping. And it got so bad that I would go to the SHOT Show for repping at the SHOT Show, come home, my wife would pick me up at the airport, we'd go to the house, she'd do my laundry and iron it all, and the next morning at 9 o'clock I'd get on the plane again and maybe go to... Uh, uh, Portland for a sports show or something. Yeah. I mean, it was it wasn't just once like that. It was years, years like fifteen that. years doing that. It was Ten. just, um, and and then I got to where you know, he, one day I was driving down. I was in, I was on the coast of Washington, and I had a show in Olympic, one in Kenton, and I don't know along the coast there, maybe one in, and I just happened to call my wife from a payphone, didn't even have a phone. I've called her from a payphone and told her, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm only 20 miles from Olympia, Olympia to set up for the show and I got plenty of time. And she goes, uh, you're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to be in Kitten. What? <laughs> it was like 90 miles away. Hell, I was going to the wrong show. <laughs> <laughs> I turned around and I made it though, but holy my moly. I remember one time I got lost in Nor and I don't know where it was Portland or somewhere, and I had a cell phone. I called you and you told me how to get to where I wanted to go. Yeah. I was driving along. I don't know where I'm at, and I told you. And I don't know. Yeah, Google machine. No, it was the event that was called MapQuest, but you yeah. could only do it on your computer. You had to print the maps out after you after you found your route. You had to yeah. print them out. I don't know where it was, but you talked me through to get me where I needed to go. One of the things what you said. I love to tell the story. Mike doesn't never like it too much, but I love to tell the story <laughs> about, you know, kind of the uncertainty of things. I think we're in Redding, California, or something like that, and we'd done okay, you know, starting down south and doing shows in these little these places. And I think it was Redding, California, and we had the show of the century. I mean, you could there was no place to stand up. I, I was checking people in, you know, Mike was getting his stuff, and, and, and we had, Mike had this little cash box because he'd always had this little cash box. Well, it was overflowing, and, and I was selling product. We had T-shirts, and mm -hmm. I sold all the product that we had. All these guys paid to come in. I lost control of the cash box, <laughs> and so I'm stuffing money in my shirt and in my pockets like this, and putting it in the jacket and stuff and the big bills, I just stuffed in my pants because I didn't want to drop or lose those, you know. <laughs> that was the, you know, you drop a hundred dollar bills, that was a big dent yeah. that night. Yeah. And so, so when it got all over, you know, and Mike went over on it, you know, because he had a, like 2,000 questions and it was just a hell of a show. I get back to the motel and Mike plops down on the bed because, you know, Mike is, Mike's not like an extrovert kind of guy. And when he gets up on the stage, and it's like uh, like something comes over yeah, him, you know. Flips so the switch. There's a lot of emotional energy I spent when he did his shows, you know, yeah. because they really were a show. So we get back to the motel, and he plops down the bed. He says, how do you think we did? I said, how do you think we did? We don't have nothing left. I said, I, I've, got, I've got money everywhere. So I started pulling out of my pockets and out of my shirt, out of this cash box that's just a pile <laughs> of stuff like this. And Mike's, hey, Mike's going, oh, geez, this is pretty good. And he's, so the ones are here and the fives, he's doing that on the bed. He's sitting there, you know, and I get all done. I pull out of the jacket and I put it on the bed, you know. And, and man, my Mike's going, boy, we really did do good. And he's got them all stacked up like this. And then I reached into my pants and I pulled out the big bills. He goes, I'm not counting that. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I had to count the big. I had to pull the rest of it out of there. Count the big. Actually, put it in an envelope yeah, and go right. to the you teller put an like that. Up. Yeah, I'll <laughs> do something with that later. That might have been the best one we ever had. I wanted to share with you my recent experience with Sawyer products. They offer a great selection of products that are must-have if you're on an outdoor adventure. Their range includes water filtration systems, insect repellent, sunscreen, and even first aid kits, so you can be prepared for any situation in the backcountry. I highly recommend their dependable and top-notch lightweight products for your next outdoor adventure. The water filters work in any situation. They even have one that is good for 400,000 gallons of water. And if you buy a water filter, you're helping to save lives all over the world. They donate millions of filters to communities that don't have clean, drinkable water. I also love their sunscreen. It lasts all day, is not greasy, and is virtually scent-free. Their bug spray repels ticks and other biting bugs. You put it on your clothes or your pets, and it's good for six washings. It even works on my horses. So before your next adventure, check them out at Sawyer.com and let them know you heard it here and thank them for supporting Eastman's. You know, uh, <laughs> when, when I used to travel there for three years, I, this is, I, I had a Honda Civic. I bought, I bought a Honda, Honda Civic, okay? You know, cowboy sitting in a Honda Civic. They're pretty comfortable. And I, you could put the back seat down and so that like the trunk and the whole back seat. And there for one year, I, for two years, I, I toured with Popeye, but the second year I toured with Popeye and another buck called Champ, and I had them mounted and had their antlers off. So I had those two bucks in the back with their antlers off, and then I had all the magazines, so every time you bought a, a subscription, you got a magazine, and that show that I met Roger that I, you know, in California for the first time, that's when I decided, okay, if these guys give me 20 bucks, no, it was twenty four ninety five for a subscription. I gave him a free video, and man, that just took off. So I had all these videos. Those videos were sitting there, just all over the seat, all the floorboard, all everywhere. And I'm, and I'm just surrounded with all this yeah. stuff. Going down, look like a gypsy. Like yeah, like a gypsy. <laughs> and I put, I, I put uh, um, snow snow tires with with uh, studs, studs, and all fours. You know, and here I am going down the road like this. I remember one time I pulled into Bakerfield because I always like to stay at the courts in. I always used to stay where I, all the time at the same place, you know, kind of. I pull, I remember pulling in and getting out and opening, the, opening up the door, the passenger door, and almost about 500 videos going flying <laughs> all, scooting all over the whole parking lot. People are looking like, what? Here's all these videos out there. And, but I'd set those mule deer up, and holy smokes, yeah, that people never seen those. Yeah, and 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 then and the reason they came, you can't duplicate my show. I, I couldn't get five people to show right now, and I'll, I'll give you the reasons. The reason is back then, you had the infancy of the Outdoor Channel, but the Outdoor Channel, they all turkeys and white tail. They never had any of these big. Uh, mule deer and elk that I was videoing and uh, these hunts we're doing and and telling people where to you know where right. we hunted and all that and not where we hunted but how to do it uh, strategies strategies for finding good areas for for your own physical ability you know all this stuff so that's the only place they could get it and so that's how come it it, it just hit a tune and people would come but I found out too that that the first first usually the first now this is I had exceptions, but usually the first year I had a lot of people there, let's say 300, maybe more, but this usually is for mathematically. Okay, at the first year I had 400, and the next year I had 200, and the next year I had 150. And no matter if every year I would send out a flyer saying this is a different show, we're talking about different stuff, talking about this and that. It just, and I realized that it wasn't going to last forever and that. And if I, if I finally, um, it finally didn't, it, it, it didn't, it, it finally went down. But, but I got so paranoid. It was such a good deal doing these shows. I got so paranoid that I was afraid somebody else would do it because by then I, I suddenly we got a few people trying to compete, you know. Oh, look there, Eastman's got a, Eastman's making a lot of money off this. Hey, let us, I'm going to start one too. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Oh my God. I can just list all these, these people trying this. So I got really paranoid. So I never, 
The only way you knew where what show I was going to is when I, we'd send you on a flyer, and that's it. And we never advertised it in the magazine or anything because I didn't want these other UMMs to to know how good a deal it was to to show up there. And I booked all my own rooms, all my own uh, facilities. I'd call up and then, you know, I had some areas that that I could repeat and there'd always be really good crowds. And I had, I call cheerleaders. Businesses have to have cheerleaders. Right. Those guys that got their, you know, master's degree in business from a college, they don't understand this, I don't think. You've got to have cheerleaders. I read a book one time just before Macintosh came out. And the book, when Macintosh came out, this book was about how they marketed Macintosh computers. And it was all about having cheerleaders and how they developed these cheerleaders. And I remembered that. This is way back before I even did this. And so I was really big on cheerleaders. I, whatever they want, I had some cheerleaders that would help me they'd come out and I wouldn't guide them. I'd tell them where to hunt. They could stay at my house. I'd kind of, Tell them how to what areas to hunt for deer or any you know anything they wanted. Some of them called up and wanted free products. My wife goes, George is calling again. He wants some free products. I said, send it to him. Send it to him. I said, don't forget, George brings in three hundred and fifty people every time we go there. Okay. Oh, okay. So you know it was more than just. Okay, I think I out. think Mike a lot of early stuff too was word of mouth because there was nothing like this. Right. And so people are looking, same as today, looking for legitimate information, but then there wasn't any, unless you got it from- Somebody you, could, somebody you, you trusted. You, you, like your dad or your uncle or your grandpa stuff. Yeah, you, you can't get it now because you couldn't do this now, duplicate this now, even though some people think they can try because you, you've got all the internet, you've got all this. Now people, People see a big deer, mule deer on the winter range, they go, oh, um, my brother is the one that started that. He started his uh, winter range mule deer videos and sold them. And that, that was really the start of, of, you know, winter range. And oh my gosh, look at all those big deer and that kind of stuff. And uh, before that, you got to realize before that there wasn't. And that's where I marketed. It's really funny, I listen, I see it. I see all these whiskeys with the Morty and Popeye. And, <laughs> and, you know, I was the one who marketed these guys. And, and I did it one show at a time. And, yeah. and, I, and I marketed and I did uh, my High Mountain Mule Deer book had Popeye in there and, and photos of him. Yeah, he was on the cover of Live in the High Country. And, and I... I <laughs> I call them the Wyoming Living Legends. Sometimes I get really ticked off. I see this sometimes on, I don't look on uh, social media much anymore. I'm too old. I, but it used to be, let's say eight years ago, I I looked at, I, or 10 years ago, I looked and here's, they'd have some old footage of mine. I took all that footage of Popeye. You know, the one where you stand there this way, then the next year, and you know, all that stuff I took. I, and, and some young, young guys, Pirate it off there and tell him like he knows everything about about Popeye. And finally, one day I got really ticked because I, I I I put a lot of I you know I I went out there and, and marketed him okay and went all over everywhere and not just him but also uh, Morty and then then Goliath which David Long helped of course uh, but uh, but and that's why I call him the Wyoming Living Legends. And so I got mad. So what I did is I took the old footage I had of Popeye and I put it into a little like a, a three minute thing. And I put it on my Facebook page. That's when I had Facebook. I got rid of it. Okay. <laughs> I put it on Facebook and I didn't know. And all of a sudden I have like 65,000 likes or something. So I go to the company right here. And I think it was Ike or I don't know, Reekers or somebody. I go, say, uh, is 56,000 a lot of number, like numbers for that was likes. That wasn't views. No, it was just likes. Likes. People hitting the thumbs and, up. Button. Uh, oh, that's a that's a runaway. That's a that's a whatever. That's just or that. I go. Mm. Said, well, I got one. What? Yeah, I just I just put on my Popeye stuff because it hadn't been on Facebook, and there it was. There I put it on. So I got I kind of got really ticked, and so I did. That goes into Mike Eastman's. 
blaze trails for God. So yeah, so <laughs> you say you don't do social media, but actually, if you want to know the truth, you, YouTube is social media because it's a two-way conversation. So it's social. But so mm -hmm. what 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 you're doing now is you're taking some of these old stories, not maybe the company stories, but some of the old hunting stories and stuff that from your past and you're putting it on YouTube with your narration and somewhat like these lectures that you were doing, but now it's on YouTube and, and you got the B-roll and you're doing the whole thing yourself. Yeah. You, you I, refuse to let us help you. No, I, I do it myself. It, little that people know the first three years of the Eastman's Hunting Journal TV show, I edited the whole thing myself. Yeah. I'd go hunting Thanks and do all, and film it all until 15th of October, and then I'd work 14, 20 hours a day, seven days a week to get get the number of the hunts from that hunt sent off the outdoor channel. I did, so I'm I'm not just he I'm just I, not a dumb cheap day. I can use a MacBook Pro, you know, early version, and he taught he taught himself to do that. Yep. Yeah. And then when he'd tell people how he edited. He, he couldn't teach anybody to do it because <laughs> he, had, he had his own way. But I will say this about that. You, you, Mike did all of his own stuff, and uh, these other big, big company corporation that had, I uh, won't mention any names, but had uh, programs on the Outdoor Channel that were in the same sort of viewer band, right. viewership band that we were. Of course, they had all professionals that sent, sent that in. One time, Mike and I went to Outdoor Channel oh, there in Temecula, and, oh. and uh, we. I take Fred. I didn't know how to get to the damn place. We, well, Mike says we're going to quit those guys. You know, we're, they're not going to like us. And I, I said, to, I told Mike, I said, okay, just let me talk first, and then you can tell them anything you want to. And so I told the guy, well, we're reviewing our business and all our relationships, and you know seeing what people think of us and whether there's a synergy there for the future. And that guy says, what the heck? This guy's vice president. He says, what the hell are you talking about? He said, uh, he said, you're one of our best programs. He said, in fact, um, our production guys, you, you are, Eastman's is our favorite program because our production guys don't have to re-edit it and clean up the beta tape that Mike would send them, you know, <laughs> in this this bizarre sort of way that he had, you know, figured out how to uh, how to edit all this, and so oh. so we went really that really took us off. Remember, I yeah. think I called you that day. Some boy, this really went yeah. pretty good, yeah. but. You know, there's so many stories about the Outdoor Channel. It's just, you know, I fooled them. I don't know if anybody wants to. Is this boring? Do you want to? I mean, I fooled the Outdoor Channel for five years. Well, before you tell that story, I, I want I want to. In throughout the history of Eastman's, you were always really good at finding technology that we could use that would make us more efficient, and it would and it would circumvent what the big guys, we always call them the big guys, what the normal strategy was. So, I mean, everything from the first magazine to be one of the first magazines in the country to ever be designed fully on a computer and then printed off of those files. Digital plate. It, yeah, digital plate. Didn't have separations and all the things. From that to learning how to edit on a Mac, on a, on a uh, iMac, I iMovie. Yeah which was the original Final Cut, and it was, you know. No, you, it, was a, it was Final Cut 1, yeah. And learning how to, how to edit on that to the cameras that we use. Mm -hmm. So tell me how you fooled the Outdoor Channel for almost better part of a decade, actually. They didn't know this was happening. Well, okay, uh, I'm gonna do this. So, I mean, so I was doing these videos and um, and I was selling them and giving and giving them out, and they were all a big, uh, Western big game hunting because I knew how to, where to hunt in the West, you know, on public land or even some buddies of mine they had private property, but mostly public land. And I could, you know, I do all that. I used to be a guide and outfitter for crumb sakes. I grew up in that culture. I mean, I started out a guiding when I was just out of high school. I just turned 19 in the wilderness, the Grove Wilderness, 
for an old time outfitter and learned how to do all that the old way. And, you know, that was just part of what you did. So any, anyway, I, I had all this and I said, you know, I think I can, we need to go on a, I said, we need to go on the, on this outdoor channel and have a TV program. I'm saying to myself, and, um, I wonder how this all works. So I made an appointment with a guy named Sherman. The same guy. Yeah. It's the same yeah, guy. Wade, yeah. Wade Sherman. Wade, Wade yeah. Sherman. But I, call, I called him up and I says, listen, I'd like to, you know, how's it work to get on your TV show with, with, my, with my TV program? And he says, what is it? And I says, it's all Western big game hunting. And he laughed. He says, well, nobody's ever done that. What do you, I said, what do you mean? He says, no, you, you can't get enough shows. He said, I'll tell you what, when you get, uh, you get like uh, 12 of them in the can, you call me back and we'll talk. I said, well, I've got like 16 of them sitting here. And he didn't say anything for about 15 or 20 seconds. I didn't say anything. He said, you, you do? I said, yeah, I, I do. And by then, yeah. Lee had bought me the, this, this publicly held company. And I wanted to do this. I'm backing up from that. Okay, I'm backing up from that. So I wanted to, I wanted to do the, the first one, a, a pilot one. And so, oh geez, how do I? But I, I did the, I did these videos, but they weren't in the right format. But they were, you know, I did them. Okay. They were vi they were videos. VHS. They were, yeah, v VHS. So the, but the be, hunts were there. Yeah, they the just hunts, weren't just edited did, for TV yet. Yeah, they weren't edited for TV, but they're there. And and his concern, well, you what he means by putting them, getting them in the can. In other words, you get them shot. Sure, yeah. Which they were shot. What I did when I when uh, Lee owned us, Lee had had um, twelve or fourteen TV show TV stations. So they they said, hey, we'll just you'll just have your own show own show on our TV station. On Sunday or Saturday or something. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, go to Omaha and to our TV station there and I'll let them edit it. So I drove clear to Omaha and went to their TV station and spent two days there. And they had a thing called Avid. Well, before that, and I know I'm getting in the weeds. Before that, people had to edit with what's called A, A, A and B roll. So you had A roll sitting here and it went across like this and you spliced it. Where you wanted it, but it was old. It was old film. Yeah, old film. Yeah. You spliced it and made it into a movie, and then you took and copied that. So when you did that, you lost generational quality of that film. It's like making a copy of a copy. Uh, yeah. In fact, you'd have to go down three copies because that's how they did it. Well, I get to this TV station, and they got this French program that's running on a computer. Holy smokes! And they're doing it on the computer. <laughs> And I said, well, how many generations is none? He says, what goes in comes out. I go, what? Yeah, what goes in comes out. Well, see, when I talked to the Outdoor Channel at first, they said, yeah, it's got to be 450 line screens. Well, really? Yeah, we can't have, and, and, and so it can't, it can't be VHS, and it can't be super VHS. It's got to be beta, beta cam. Because of generation. Oh, okay. So I said, I'm pretty well out of that. So I went there. To, went to this Omaha place and I go, and my light went off my head. I go, holy shit. So I said, well, I thought, well, maybe I'll get one of these. How much is that? He says, oh, the program is 175000 You know, that's out of it. <laughs> I don't need another house. Okay, so I, I went home and I had this, you know, copy. They made this because we were planning on doing it to the TV shows. Or at their TV stations. In the meantime, um, I bought the company back, kind of. And so here, here I sit, and then I, I see a guy over here in Powell, where we are now. He he was he was doing video work. So I I I had been doing my TV shows or my videos. Get this, beat guys. Get this. I'm doing my videos for my hunting videos with with a software in a computer, but it could only cut within a second and a half. Wait, well, what does that mean? That means that you got a kill scene. This guy that sit there for a dozen times stopping it, trying to get it the right because it wasn't 29 frames a second. It could only go like 50 frames. And then the, the, the computer would crash and you had to boot it back up. And you know, it was just this, this 
commie thing, and then he'd bring it out in super VHS, and then I'd take that, and by the time I got done, the line screen went to hell, but it was okay to put in your VHS player and watch Mike Eastman hunt, okay? So I went over to this guy here in town, and he had he had a different one called Media Eye or something, but it was, it was kind of like a dummy down of the $175,000 one, and he could do them. And they, could, they came, they spit out at the same resolutions of cameras. And my cameras was only, that was just when they came out with a three chip camera. Right. And that camera was 480 line screens and it was three chips. What does that mean? Okay, you got RGB, red, R's red, G, RG. It's, it's red, blue, yellow. Yeah. And, and the ones before that, the video cameras, the cheap ones just had one chip and all three went in there. So the reds would bleed. If you ever watch the old stuff, you see a red would be bleeding. Somebody have their orange on and it yeah, just looked like it was glowing. Off of these shoulders and stuff. Well, this, uh, uh, that each chip would have its own color. So I could pop that sucker out at, at the same, which is 380. Well, at that time, me and Fred went to, uh, no, it wasn't that. It was so I had a, I had a I had a three a, at uh, four eighty, and uh, the guy says, "Yeah, um, you you know it has to be four eighty." I said, "Okay," and so I gave him, I gave him two of those films, and they had a scopey thing, and they could tell how many line screens. They go, well, "Yeah, it's four eighty." So here I am. Everybody's having to use these big beta, beta cam cameras that cost. $50,000 and they have to drag around a, a player and then they have these big suites where they have to do it all this and here's Mike Eastman having a little guy over here doing it in a little computer and spitting it out and sending it to him and I did that for about four years before those people even caught on that that technology was even around. Yeah, they, they never did realize you did it. They still no, don't know that you no, did this. And, and no, they never knew. And then when we walked in, and like Fred said, we talked to Wade Sherman, and at that time they just went publicly held. And those guys bought all this, all this HD equipment. I mean, we're talking a million dollars worth. And I go on, and he says, "Look at this." They had a big screen there, and he played some of this HD. And yeah, my eyes got holy smokes. And, and I go, "Well, you know, we're just a hunting show. We're, you know, we're not." You know, we're not NFL football. He says, well, that's what it's all going to. And I says, those cameras can't work in low light. I know they can't because because you had one, and you don't know it, but you had one up in the Arctic. And I and the guy was complaining to me that as soon as it got afternoon, he couldn't shoot anymore. <laughs> as soon as the sun started going yeah. down. As soon as it got even <laughs> half dusk. Which is not and, ideal for hunting. And I said, oh, okay, well, as soon as we have, we can. Well, you're going to have to buy this equipment. I said to myself, no, they're going to come up with cheaper ones. They're going to come up with, with it's called interlace, where you don't have to have, uh, you won't have to have 444. You can have a 2122 or something. Well, that's technical stuff. But anyway. So, so you use the technology as it came out. Similar to what we're doing with Tag Hub 2.0, is we, we looked and said, the MRS data in the back of the magazine is really useful and really helpful, but if we could make a digital version of this and actually make it work on an app and actually make it work on a computer and the two things talk like they're supposed to, like everybody dreams they will, it'll be worth it. And that's what we're doing with Tag Hub 2.0. So my point is we've been doing these technological changes forever. And you ought to see two point, or Tag Hub 3.0, which I've, I've, I've got... I've got to, to see some of the technology as, as we're building it. It's an unbelievable, unbelievable, using AI and everything else. Um, so filming, we're kind of talking about TV shows. You guys went on a, a, an amazing adventure to Tanzania uh, way back in the, oh gosh, it had to have been 2005, maybe six, something like that. Oh, no, Two, I, I think. Was I it 2002? Went. Yeah. I went in, in 98, 99. I went over there. Well, you went in 99 for the first time because you almost missed my wedding. It's 2002 we went, Mike, to Tanzania. Because you, you retired in 2001. Yeah. I would go over there and spend the summer over there. So so tell me how this whole thing played out. Because you were over there. You were already over there with another guy. Because you went over with Art right before that, right? No. Before 
What, do you want to know? What do you want to know? Well, I just want our, him and I story. Or? Well, I was that I was headed there. I was I was just going to transition into to Africa. So to to if you want to start with you went over in ninety nine. Oh no, ninety nine, and then um, Taylor say he's going to have Sharovsky come over and film, and he wanted to film both of them. And so I didn't have a cameraman, and I knew Fred. And I said, Fred, you want to go over there? He said, Sure. So. He, he came over and so that. one of the Swarovski family, his last name was Swarovski, right. is Swarovski, and the president of Swarovski USA were, went over to Africa hunting, yeah. and they wanted to film it and asked you to film it, and to, and then you asked Fred to be the second camera guy. I needed a second guy and asked Fred if he yeah. And this was the wild wild west, as far as Tanzania was crazy. I went over in you guys went in twenty or o two. I went in o three. I went over there clear in 05 and then quit when Taylor died. I'd seen Mike at SCI, Mike and Bertie at SCI, and Mike, Mike's telling me what he's going to do. And I told him, I said, well, I've retired. And uh, as my retirement gift, I bought myself an XL1 camera. At the time, the best camera in the business. Still, in my mind, maybe the best audio camera. Uh, that was quite a long time ago. But uh, so, and then Mike says, well, I need a second camera. You want to go to Tanzania? I said, sure, you know. And then he said, well, I'll need you to do this and this and this and this and this. And can you do all those things? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about. You know? <laughs> yeah, I could do that stuff. And off we went. Well, I was already over there. I, I used to go there for first of June. If you remember, and you came, and you came for, for Maury's hunt. Well, actually, you stayed because you filmed Guy's Hunt, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you stayed, and then that was in August. And then we, and then I, I went home. Oh, yeah, you went home. The whole family went home, including me. Yeah. But I've been there since June, filming other so, people's stuff. Yeah, we did this, We I came in June. I, I, I uh, kept it all that stuff in a photo album, and I looked at the, Impala hotel date, <laughs> and it was like the sixth of June or something like that. So, so t some, tell me some of the funny stories that happened on that. I've heard these stories a million times. What about the lion? Where I don't remember who the hunter was, but the lion got killed finally, and the other lions surrounded it. Well, that's. Fred's they, story, but you better not tell who it was because then we'll get in trouble with a suit. But you can s just say a client. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, that was Fred's story. Yeah, that was uh, one of the clients where we were up in the back of uh, the best hunting rig in the world that Toyota makes. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of a semi high rack. And, and, and we're backed up into this uh, little grove of trees and we saw this single line of lions coming, coming at us. And there must have been eight or nine of them in a single file deal. And the third one was a great big full mane, full mane lion and uh, a male. And uh, so this client gets on him and he's, there's a bar, you know, that goes around this high rack and he's got he's laid on like this and I have this XL camera and I'm on the line like this I'm expecting to shoot you got to shoot pretty soon dude <laughs> and these lions are walking by, by us and not I mean they're not they're not 30 yards away you know you know less than that if they'd have looked over they would have seen us but they didn't and so it gets to where this line's about perpendicular. Now I'm starting to get kind of concerned, you know, because I have to be behind him. So I hold on to the bar like this, and I lean back with the camera like this, you know, and he lets this line get all the way by him before he touches it off. And this, this big old male explodes in violence, you know, just tremendous footage, you know, he just put on a heck of a show but when he did that, he had a, he had a uh, muzzle brake on, on there, and he, and he burnt all the hair off my hand, the back of my <laughs> hand and my, and my arm. And uh, when we got, when we, the, 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 he's in deep, you know, elephant grass, the yellow grass we call it. 
and all the other lions came and surrounded him. So we had a, you know, we had an adventure just getting to this guy because they wouldn't back off. Turn on the radio, whistle, yell, shot the guns. They finally backed off. I got back and Mike says, how'd it go? And I said, well, you know, we got tremendous footage of a great lion, but that client burned all the hair on the <laughs> back of my mind. And Mike went off, man. He, because, he, you know, your dad's not a muzzle brake guy. No. We and, can't hunt uh, with muzzle brakes. Because they, they used to, we still don't, because they move the cameras. Yeah. They warp the air and, and, and change the view of the camera. Yeah, or they blow snow and dust if, mm -hmm. you're, if you're down low. But Mike, uh, Mike, I would say, at the top of his lungs, educated pretty much everybody at camp <laughs> about about the new rule about muzzle brakes, and that's how that went. But, <laughs> Jeez. So, um, the so obviously the the characters that that we've met throughout the years has has always been fun and and unique. What is your guys' thoughts? Um, and, and I'll ask Dad first on the industry and where it's headed, where it came from. I um, mean, you've been in the, you know, running this company for 37 years, or a, a part of this company for 37 years, and where, you know, where do you think it's heading? If you could predict where hunting is going, do you think it's growing? Do you think it's shrinking? Do you think we've gone too far with technology? Do you think we haven't gone far enough? What's your thoughts? Well, I, th I, I think in the future there's going to be less public land hunting uh, because of the resources being strained. And for many reasons, you just can't say it's because of this. So what is happening even right now, most of the, the hunting is, is done on private property where it is able to be managed better. Technology, I think that's it. The people that are hunting now, I can't say all the people, I shouldn't say that, I'll get a bunch of blowback. But the, the ability to, to stock, the ability to be efficient, and is being, you know, circumvented and and by using technology, in some instances, I think it's, it's taken away some of the joy of really hunting. Some and a lot of, the of these people don't understand it because they never were, were they were never exposed to the, what I would call the other type of hunting. So it, it seems to me, I think you're right. I think it's, it, the, some of the technology is circumventing the ability or the skill that is required to make a good, clean, ethical shot, at a, and and stalk and hunt and be able to you know match wits and skill with with an animal in their front yard, I think that's I think that's really fair. What's what's one of the things that you look at in the hunting industry as being a positive thing? Probably, I, I think, is these organizations that are helping to, and they get a bad rap by the people that don't, don't put skin in the game. In other words, they don't contribute to financially to the, to the management or the taking care of wildlife or, or buying property or, except for their own use. So you're talking organizations like Elk Foundation. Elk Foundation. Foundation. Now, Jeez. you know, they all have their, pro I think they all have their problems. You know, they become an organization. They become bureaucrats and, you know, oh, I'll get blowback, but I don't care. I'm an old guy. What are you guys going to do? <laughs> Take my license away? But it's, it's just natural. It's just natural. That's how, the, that's how it works. And but, so, uh, but there's, they have skin in the game. They are contributing to the North American wildlife and model, right? And and not only that, they, they put the money into it. You no, know, none of these other organizations that say they're 
protecting animals. They they just put their money in a bunch of lawyers. Lawyers and marketing. Yeah. That's to get more money. To get more money for more lawyers, more marketing. As far as I'm concerned, if, if you think different, just show me the figures. Show show me where where they they go out and buy a great big piece of property and and then not just lock it up, but make it so the probably can can enjoy it, whether it's hunting or recreation or walking or taking pictures of flowers or whatever. Right. Um, anyway, that's my opinion. So, Fred, I'll ask you the same thing. What's you know what what do you think being in this industry for a very long time and, and surrounding it? I mean, right now you you hunt in Sonora. You're an outfitter in Sonora, um, which is a different type of hunting and it's a different world down there, almost completely different than what I'm traditionally using for mule deer hunting or, or, or sheep hunting, which you guys do all winter. Um, Agua Dulce has been around for 30 some years and, and it's it's a great operation, but the things are changing there. But what are, what are some of the things that you've seen um, in the industry and what some of the concerns that you have in the hunting industry? Yeah, actually, it's an interesting question because uh, it's, it's connected to our operation in Mexico in sort of an inverse order. I, I, in my opinion, and, uh, today, the biggest problem for big game hunting in the United States is, is the number of prospective hunters is growing and the opportunity to hunt is declining. And so that makes it more expensive for people. When you, have a, when you have a young man that's 25 or 27 years old, could be, a, could be a, a female as well, but if you have a young man that's 25 or 27 years old, he's got a wife and a three-year-old kid and a baby on the way, and his wife says, wait a second, let me ask, let me see, make sure I get this right. You wanna send money to the state and they're gonna hold it and maybe when you do that for 10 years, you get the opportunity to hunt. Uh, wouldn't that money be better spent on our children or something else? And so people will make those kinds of decisions as this gets more difficult. It benefits us in Mexico because um, you can, it's pretty much like all of it as landowner tags would be the equivalent of landowner tags. So you can hunt big deer every year and you can hunt as many as you have money for. So it kind of helps us, but I think the, and still the, the number of licensed hunters in the United States is strong. Yeah. And um, the opportunity to, um, to take advantage of that uh, and, and draw something or and have an opportunity to hunt is declining. And uh, that, you know, that is a problem that will need to be solved or at least mitigated at some level in the future. Otherwise, this thing begins to, I call it like dive into the Pacific like a Japanese zero. You, yeah. know, once, you, you know, once you head, head that direction, the, the only thing that's left is a big splash in the, in the water. But um, in, I live in Arizona, in southern Arizona, and so one of the things that's happened there is they restricted the use of game cameras in the hunting process. You know, you can scout and do that, but once the, you know, once the season starts and this uh, interactive technology between game cameras and laptops has been restricted. And so I think you're gonna, we'll see more of that uh, happen. Um, you know, electronic sighting sites and stuff like that. I think you're going to see more of that as these regulating agencies see technology as giving the hunter too much of an advantage mm -hmm. when to balance this out. Um, the biggest thing I think about technology is for a hunter, the benefit. Uh, whenever you use these other devices, you're hunting less. Yes. It becomes shooting, not hunting. And so you know me, I'm a hunter, I'm a grunt hunter, that's what I do. Um, and not a technology, so much a technology hunter. But uh, the one thing that technology is really benefiting people with, hunters with, is information. Accurate information is everything. There's not a, a person who's watched, hunters watching this podcast that hasn't hunted in the wrong spot before yeah. because just didn't have good enough information. 
And so I, I think the future for hunting is in um, information management and the quality of information. And we'll see about these other things. I'm not knocking people who do that, but you can see that in the future as the regular ears try and balance the interest of the animals and the interest of the hunters. And, um, and the third thing you asked Mike about, I, I, you know, I'm a life member of a lot of these organizations, and I think that the Elk Foundation, the Mule Deer Foundation, the, the Wild Turkey Foundation has done remarkable work. They've reintroduced turkeys and elk, for that matter, in states that haven't had them for hundreds, hundred years or so. And they've been working on the habitat, and what works with the habitat works in not just with the mule deer, but it works, all, you know, across the the spectrum of species that are that are utilizing that. That's habitat. right. And so now you have conservation easements and things like that instead of a, you know, ranchette development right. in the winter grounds. Right. And so all of those things. I think are led by people who, well, you know, sportsmen, sportsmen raise most of the money that goes to wildlife in the yeah. United States. Yes. I forget what the, 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 the percentage is like 80% or something yeah. like something in, of that magnitude. And so they're tremendous organizations. And, you know, if you're not a member, you need to be a member so you can protect the future or promote the future of the activity that you love so much. That's right. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. Um, you know, I, I know we told some funny stories and we told some uh, some interesting ideas and uh, told some history, some history that probably a lot of guys sitting out, uh, maybe even in my office, don't know some of those stories that, you know, how this thing was really bootstrapped. And I think it's very important that we, that we recorded it and we preserved that so that, you know, down the road, the next step or the next generation of, of people can understand that uh, when I was growing up, my dad was never home. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about this uh, YouTube thing online. It's not just me. I, my father, I started, it's called Mike Eastman's Blaze Trails Forgotten. And there's one story about a Blaze Trail that I was lost and got out by using them. But... My father had a lot of experiences, and he I tried to get him to put them in a book. By the time he was ready to do that, or he, he forgot everything because of the aneurysm he had in his brain. And so I'm the only one, I have, I have two other brothers, but mo I think, I believe most, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time on this earlier stuff, they were too young, and I used to sit and listen to this. So I've... Uh, I've, I've done all his, a lot of his stories or do a lot more in a lot of mine so that, that my grandkids and great-great-grandkids will have something to look back and see what, what this old guy did and see how it was back then. Because even right now, like you or you, you guys don't know how it was back in 1958 or 1961 in Wyoming when it come to wildlife. It's all gone. And, and, and another five or six years, I, if I still live that long, I might be the only one that really remembers that what it was. And, and some of the stuff that I, I noticed, and I won't get into this, but some of the stuff that game wardens and biologists are, are dealing with right now, some of the information they, they didn't know, and some of the information I know that they think they know is stuff that I don't think is, is, is really what, what happened. Really accurate. Well, yeah, in 19, I, I did that book, Hunting High Country Mule Deer, copyrighted in 1996. And in that book, chapter 19, you read chapter, there's four pair, there's four sentences there saying if they don't, they, if they keep, if they keep subdividing down there on these migrational routes in Wyoming, they're not going to have any deer. So you flash forward to when? When did they decide they had, they had all these? Four years ago. Four years, years ago. ago. 1990 and 2019, so yeah, almost 30 years later, they I figure out exactly what happened. And I'm that's not the exactly only one. Was. Yeah, all of us, all of us that that guided or hunted, we we knew where all those deer were going. 
Well, Blaze Trails Forgotten, check it out on YouTube. Uh, if you like to watch uh, stories and old time stories, I've, I've gotten a ton of people inside the industry and just regular uh, people that, that stop and talk to me that say they love that. So can keep doing it. Really? Yes. It's a pain. Uh, Let me tell you folks, it's a pain. Okay? <laughs> I'm sitting here listening to you talk, Ike, and it just occurs to me that there is stories that, that Mike and I can tell in this environment, and there are stories that you have to buy us a beer sometime when you, <laughs> when you see us and we'll tell you the other ones yeah, that we can't right. do here. That's right. Yeah. I'll go adult say outfitters. You guys got a website, Facebook? I, I, we do. Uh, com, and um, hunting in Mexico right now is as good as it's been in a yep. long time. Yep. And uh, of course, always check out, uh, we have our YouTube channel, Eastman's Hunting Journals. There's always gear reviews on there. There's there's hunting, uh, there's Beyond the Grib. There's Eastman's Hunting TV is now on there as well as the Outdoor Channel. Um, so check that out. Check out Eastman's, Eastman's magazines, both the Hunting Journal and the Bow Hunting Journal. Taghub.com. Um, gosh, everything else we're doing. This is one of six podcasts. If you like hunting information, check out those other ones. And I uh, appreciate you listening today. And hopefully you got something out of it if, if you're on your way to work. If nothing else, hopefully you got a couple, couple chuckles and, and some uh, stories to tell the guys around the campfire. Thank you, folks, and uh, good hunting. <laughs>